And so that's what I really love about street music. It's in the moment. And so we had done some scouting, and what we were finding were the most interesting characters. I mean, I remember starting off with a guy named Gomez, and we were walking up to him, and he was playing on the streets here on Sunset Boulevard. And he ends up uh, walking over to a payphone, and we're thinking, oh, what, what's going on? Is he leaving? Like, what's happening? And we follow him with the camera, and he's tuning his guitar to the phone. <laughs> <laughs> because you know the note of the of the of of the uh, of the phone is a, is a note that they could tune to, so you know I just start to realize, and then you know you start to get deeper and deeper into, and you start to really find characters and experiences, and you start to find that what it what it is is incredibly humbling, and so what I had done is I, I we worked with Whitney and we put together a great crew, and we decided let's make a documentary. We called it a cinematic discovery of street musicians. A cinematic discovery of, of street, street musicians. musicians. <laughs> right. So what we did is we went from Los Angeles to New Orleans pre-Katrina into New York City, essentially looking, metaphorically speaking, for those monks. Yeah. Yeah. And what we found now, now, but before I had permission from Whitney to actually make this all happen, she loved everything, all the ideas. She loved the scouting and all this. But she said, we just need more. I mean, we need to make it a little more special. What else can we do? And I remember staying up at night, you know, wondering, what else can I do? What else can I do? And one night, about 3 in the morning, I wake up, and I just knew, oh, my gosh, we got it. What I'm going to do is I'll add them all to make songs as we go from one location to the next location to the next location. That way, we're creating something where all these different cultures are making something both bigger than themselves and something that otherwise never could have existed. And then well, another thing that I had learned, I guess by being in Los Angeles, because in New York City, it was mostly just audio for me, music. But out here, there's so much film yeah. and so much video. And then I realized, you know, when you combine audio and video, the senses can become overloaded. You can actually have the most possible way of impacting a human being when you put them both together. And that's when I realized, like, wow, you know, if we make these songs across America and we film it, people are going to get the integrity, the notes, the choices, the humanity of the musicians, but they're going to get to see it and hear it at the same time. And since they're all playing in real natural environments, none of it's staged. You know, we show up, they're there, and we make this moment happen. Suddenly we realize, well, this could be a great thing to go explore. I just got a hunch that this is going to lead to something powerful. So I said, okay, what we'll do is we'll make a song called Blues Across America. Blues Across America. America. That was the very first song that I had ever done in this style. And it just was incredible because we ended up having the guitar solo trade off between Venice Beach and Harlem in front of a fish shop. Yep. And, you know, and you're watching this and you're realizing that, like the characteristics of those people, of those places, are fully represented in this music. And now you can see it. And it started to just make me feel really proud of who we were as a culture and as a society. Because this is a really profound way of showing the diversity of America, about showing about the, the, the roots of the music. You know, blues is an integral part of where all of our music comes from. And then the sincerity and the humbling factor of street musicians, oftentimes homeless. Um, you know, but the funny thing about it is sometimes they were homeless, but sometimes they were millionaires. I mean, I filmed millionaires who were playing music on the street because they just wanted to. So we started to realize that, and I remember talking to a friend about this, and she says to me, well, you should call this playing for change then, because some of them are playing for money to go home and feed themselves, but others are just playing to change something in their lives or the experience with the person who walks by them and collectively manifest something bigger than themselves. And in, in, in reality, as I look back, I mean, almost all musicians are doing that all the time anyway. Yeah. And so is the listener when it matters to them. Right. So they're yeah. all in that kind of place where they're looking to be some kind of collective conscious, conscience. And so this sort of led to the idea that we can make this happen. We can make these songs around, uh, first across America. And then, you know, the diversity of America, open, and by growing up outside New York City, the diversity of New York City, it really opens you up to wanting to explore the whole world. Because it's not just Americans that you're meeting or that are inspiring you. It's all different groups. 
And that's when I realized, okay, so then a few years go by, we finish that film, and then I get the feeling that, well, you know, this is bigger. You know, this is sort of like one chapter to the next chapter. But in Hollywood, I mean, it would have been easy to just say, well, hey, nice film. Good luck with whatever you want to do in your life. Yeah. And I felt like that was the moment um, that I was facing because we had finished the film, but we didn't really know anyone. There were no famous people in the movie. There was no sex. There was no violence. And I was like, without those three, what are the chances anybody yeah. watches this thing? Sure. <laughs> you know. Uh, but fortunately, back then, the Sundance Channel was a big deal, at least for the small amount of people that cared about independent documentaries. And so they picked up our film, and it had tremendous success, but it was a really raw, great sort of insight. And you know, when I was in college, as an interpersonal communication major, I had one interesting thing happen where I took a film class. But the only film that we really studied, style, was ethnography. Ethnography. Ethnography, which is essentially the form of making film without having yourself present in it, where it's really just about the moment to the audience with as little filter as possible. Give me an example of a, the, an ethnographic great. moment. Yeah, the, 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 the experience that I studied in school was to make a, make a short film or to study a short film on um, gay and lesbian transvestites in homeless transvestites in New York City at a ball that they were throwing. Now what's interesting is normally people would bring with that context a number of preconceived notions of what they're going to experience, whether they be positive or negative. The art of ethnography would be to eliminate all of them and to simply offer the audience as transparent an experience, an objective experience as possible. You, uh, you aim the camera, you turn on the microphone, you shut up and get out of the way. That's it. That's it. And, and it's not about eth you eth bringing this to them. It's about this is happening, you're here, yep. that experience. Got and it's it. really very similar to what I was saying about a song. You know, the experience, they play a song, you react, and that's the, essentially the humanity of it all. Yes. You know, so this kind of led to an idea that, well, we can film in that style all over the world, all in these street corners, because I don't want you to see what I feel about these musicians. I want you to experience it as if you're here. And because of the fact that I had come from the hit factory, I was able actually bringing the same equipment I would use on Paul Simon on the street. Now that had never really happened. It seemed like what had happened with most documentaries at that time was they were really low quality audio. And so if a guy was performing in the street, it was distorted or it was just kind of a wimpy sound. And you don't, you know, so you kind of look at them with your stereotype. Oh, nice street musician, perhaps. But when you bring great microphones and you find a great musician on the street, you know, I would take the headphones off and I was thinking, wow, that sounds terrible. I can't hear them. But you put the headphones back on and you're thinking, my God, what a great moment for the audience because they're actually getting something better than the moment because the moment had this low fidelity. Got it. But we were recording separate for ourselves with nice microphones and feeding that to the audience. And so suddenly I realized, wow, you know, without changing the moment, we're actually enhancing it for whoever's watching. And then you start to realize that this is starting to impact people because now the street musician is not this thing to be looked down upon, but instead something to be lifted up, you know? And so that sort of led to it the idea that, wow, I want to try this concept all over the world, where I'm, I'm, I'm just going to travel the world and I'm going to find more and more of these human moments. And I'm not going to limit myself to anything um, preconceived. I'm going to go to places where I have n you know, no idea what I'm going to find. And I'm going to trust in the humanity of the world to guide us into making something bigger than ourselves. Like, let's go find out. And it was an honor back to, like I had mentioned, Biggie Smalls or Jackson Brown or Paul Simon, or all the great ones that had taught me about being humble and about the potential that of life-changing experiences music can provide. I said, that's all I'm going to use as my guide. And we're going to go out there and we're going to see what we can discover.